And if you have your Bible, open it to James chapter 3, and we're going to, be in, we're going to start in verse 3. We're in a series called In My Element, and today I want to talk to you about the courage to pray. Last week, if you weren't here, I challenge you to get on the app, go to the website, go to YouTube, and listen to the sermon. It's like 29 minutes long, and it's, it will encourage you that God wants to hear from you and that prayer would become something more than just praying for your food or praying that you do good on a test, but that it would become your lifestyle. Father, thank you for the word. I'm asking God today that you would fill the people of God with courage to become prayer warriors, Lord, to become people who boldly ask you, who pray audacious prayers. Lord, I'm asking that, that a religious spirit would be broken off of this house, that relationship with Jesus would become the primary of our, of our hearts. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you might think it's a little weird, the, the little portion of scripture I'm going to start with when it comes to prayer, but trust me, I think you'll get it. James 3, verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of a horse to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. How many know that's true? A, a big old animal. You can go like this and he goes left. How many you ever ridden a horse? I did when I was on our property. I hated it. They're so big, and they're so, like, whenever they, they do that little shaky thing, and I feel like they're going to buck me off. But it is crazy that you can do this with a giant animal, and he, and he turns. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder when the pilot, where the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Oh, isn't that encouraging? <laughs> Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Verse 9. When the tongue, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's uh, likeness. Out of the sound ma- same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brother, this should not be. Can both fresh, and, fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives and a grapevine bear fi- figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. How many you know the tongue and I've said this to you before, has caused more problems probably than anything in the world. I've been around, when I, before I became a Christian, I remember being in environments where our band would play, where people had been drinking, and all it took, and I remember one night, this fight broke out, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a drummer in a band. I, I just, I didn't, I'm not a fighter, I didn't want to scrap with anybody, and I was 15 years old, and all the guys in the band were in their 20s, and I was, we were playing this big thing, and uh, a fight broke out between a bunch of weightlifters and a bunch of skinny little heavy metal guys. And um, it started over a word. Somebody said a word. And then you always get this, what'd you say? And then it's like cats. <laughs> right? They're going at it. And I don't even know what's going on. And I remember being trapped in this place where we were playing and this massive fight is going on. People are tearing boards off of fences and hitting each other with nails and, and, and the CHP show up and the sheriff show up and I just want out, right? I just want to get my drums. So we go, we're on the way out and the sheriff stops us and like, how old are you? And that wasn't good. And, and uh, <laughs> how did this fight start? One word. Somebody said something that offended someone, and if you don't have self-control and you have anger in your heart, that's all it takes is, is words, people fighting. Countries have gone to war over words. So listen to this. The lowest use of our tongue, according to this scripture, the lowest use of our tongue is for complaining, gossiping, and cursing. That is the literal lowest use of your tongue, is to gossip, slander, and curse people with, according to this scripture. The highest use of your tongue is to praise God, is to, is to pray to him. God gave you this tongue for more than just talking about people. God, get, God put this little thing in your mouth 
The reason why he put this in, the original reason why God put the tongue in your mouth is so that you could communicate with others, so that you could communicate with him, so you could sing to him, pray to him, and watch this. The highest use of your tongue is so that you can bless others. And we live in a culture that doesn't do that very well. There are whole TV programs all about slandering and gossiping and coming against people. Have you noticed this? I don't know what the show is. I don't have cable anymore, but it's, uh, they just sit around. They literally just sit around and just play clips from famous people and, and just bark at them and just mock them. You see, that's what the Bible calls the flesh. And the Bible says that our tongue, if we're not careful, can be set on fire with hell. So, so here's the question I have for you. What, what do you want to use your tongue for? What do you want to use that thing in your mouth that God gave you? By the way, it's a blessing because you can taste food, right? You can say nice things, but I would say that a large portion of people use their tongues for lower purposes, the lowest purpose of the tongue. The Bible says that the tongue is set on fire by what? Hell. So as believers, we have to learn to submit our tongues to things that are higher than its lowest use. We have to say, Lord, how many of you have ever just wanted to criticize somebody? Raise your hand. Come on. If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> how many of you just ever had the thought when you see something, you just, you just want to speak in the moment? You just, you just, you just feel like you, you just got to say something. I do it when I'm driving. I'll say things to other drivers. They can't even hear me. They can't even hear me. They don't even know that I'm talking. And, I'm call and one day, uh, a lady uh, pulled out in front of me, and um, I don't know what she was thinking, but it was, you know, we're going 55, and she just, ha, ha, didn't even look, just, and I, you know, you're slamming on, and, and here's what, you know, and you say stuff like this, you dummy, you idiot. Some of you might use other words, <laughs> right? You're, you're using, watch this. And the Lord told me one day, I was, I was this, this happened, and I, and I was like, what are you doing, you moron, is what I said. And the Lord said to me, why are you cursing her? And I was like, oh, I'm not really cursing her. Lord, this is just the way it is in America, <laughs> right? This is just the way it is. And the Lord said, I want you to bless her. And so I was like, all right. Lord, I pray you'd protect her. He didn't say, pray protection. He said, bless her. All right, Father, she's not a moron. I'll bet you she's really smart. Lord, bless her today, fill her today. See, it's just the habit of our flesh. It's the nature of our flesh to want to be critical. It's not, I've said it to you before, Listen, the gift of criticism is not a fruit of the Spirit. There's a lot of people in the church that think it's a gift. They're like, do you guys see what's going on here? Do you, do, you, do you agree with this? You ever seen those people? And then somebody goes, well, I don't know. And then they wink a little bit, and they, now all of a sudden we got a little crew, and they're all, their tongues are set on fire by hell. Here's how I know somebody cares about the church and cares about and loves me is if they have a concern, they come to me and talk to me. And their desire is for us to become better, not to complain. That's how you know. If you're gathering people around you with this, and it's negative, and it's, and it's, it's gossip and slander, look right here. It's not the Spirit of God. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's another spirit. It's your flesh. Amen? Amen. So here's my question for you. What use do you want your tongue to have? And what do you think the highest use of your tongue is? I would say the highest use of your tongue, the highest use of your tongue is to speak to God, is to talk to him, is to worship him. And I would say the second highest use is that God created us relationally to hang out with each other. The, the, the second use of our tongue that would be the highest use is that you would bless somebody. That doesn't mean that we can't say to somebody, hey, look, I'm concerned about what's going on in your heart or in your life. I'm concerned about you. That's not gossip. That's not evil to say, man, I'm concerned. Here's how you know. If you want somebody to become better, that's how you know you're on the right track. When you know, I, I just want your benefit. I want to bless you. That's the greatest use of your tongue, to bless the Lord and to bless mankind. We need more blessing in the world, don't we? 
because there's a whole lot of cursing. The Democrats, the Republicans, Trump, Adam Schiff, and they're all just, they're like the cats, right? They say a word and tweet a tweet, and then everybody gets all disturbed, and Christians are running around with not a blessing tongue, but with a cursing tongue, no different than everybody else. I'm going to tell you that the Lord's given you a tongue and a heart that you could talk to him and that you could change things. I want to show you something. James, if you're in the book of James still, go to James chapter 5, verse 13. You all know this portion of scripture if you've been a Christian a while. James chapter 5, verse 13. Listen to what it says. Is any one of you in trouble? Anybody in trouble? You got issues going on. I'm not talking about in trouble because you passed your, t- you failed your test that you didn't study for. But is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Look at that. He should pray. Is anyone happy? Anybody in here happy? Come on. Look what the Bible says you should do. Watch this. Let him sing song of praise. Isn't that cool? Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over them. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Watch. Watch this. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. I love this. Seven times the word prayer is used in there. So, you think prayer is important? It's all over scripture. I can't believe people want to argue with me on if we should pray. How much should we pray? Are we praying too much? It's all over scripture. If you're happy, worship and pray. Sing songs. If you're having a problem, pray. If you're sick, pray. Are you getting it? Maybe we should just pray a lot. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Does that mean we just walk around town? Under our breath? No, it means that we're always positioned, like Jen said, we're always positioned to hear from God and to pray. We're constantly ready to pray. We're constantly under our breath even. Sometimes we'll see something and just start to pray. You're effective and powerful. I want you to see... What the, verse 17 is going to be our focus. Verse 17. Elijah was a man just like us. Say, just like us. Yes. Elijah, the prophet of God in the Old Testament who did amazing things. This is what it declares about him, that he was a man just like you. He was human being. And so here's where this comes from. This Elijah prayed for rain and you know, or he, he prayed and it didn't rain and then he prayed and it rained. Here's where the, this story comes from in 1 Kings 17 and 18, chapter 17 and 18. I'm not going to read it all. That's your homework tonight. Ahab, King Ahab and Jezebel, his wife, had caused the children of Israel to sin by worshiping Baal or Baal, the prophet, the false prophet, the idol that they worshiped. They, they had got, Israel had sinned against the Lord and started to worship at this false place. And so what did the Lord do? The Lord said, sweet, I'm going to shut down the rain. How many know when rain gets shut down, there's problems, right? California, for years, we had all this issue because there was no rain. Am I right? And so what happened? Crops begin to fail. You drive around I-5, all, the, all that produce, nothing was happening. So watch this. God drew, drew away from them the very thing that would bless them, and that is rain. And Elijah prayed. He just said, it's not going to rain. He told King Ahab, it's not going to rain here. Because you're, you guys, how many know Jezebel was a problem? You guys are causing the people of God to sin. And by the way, there are things today that the body of Christ submits to that I think are no different than, than Baal worship. There's no difference. We're submitting ourselves to things, to TV, to certain programs, to certain ideas, to certain ideology that is not biblical, that is not scriptural, that does not please the Lord. And then we wonder why things are drying up and the church is shrinking in America. Well, maybe because we're we're serving things we shouldn't serve. And so Elijah has a showdown with the prophets of of Baal. I love this story. He's like, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build an altar and the first, if you're God, you guys call on your God, and if he calls fire down from heaven, 
you're God's God. And if I do it and fire comes down, then my God's God. And then you guys, I'm going to kill all of you. And they're like, deal. It's a bad deal. So they begin to, the Bible says they literally, the prophets of Baal, which would literally be like the occult practices of today, witchcraft, satanic worship. It was the same kind of thing. Cutting themselves, the Bible says, to attract their God, to, to do what they think he should do. And they, the Bible says that they literally, could you just imagine a, a bunch of people doing this and, and Elijah is just standing there and he actually mocks them at one point. He says, hey, what's going on with your God? Like, uh, is he on the toilet? That's what one trans- translation says. The Disney translation says that. Is he on the toilet? And then he says, all right, guys, look. Enough is enough. Your God's, your God's not real. He's not going to do anything. And he says, matter of fact, go get water and pour water on the wood. How many know when you're asking fire to come from heaven, you want it to be dry? You want it to be the slightest spark is going to set this thing off. They soak it with water, and Elijah prays, and fire comes down. And watch, it didn't take hours. This was boom, prayer, fire, pow. The, 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 the wood pile is just on fire, and everyone's, and they're like, wow, your God is the real God. And then Elijah's like, yeah, and then he kills him. He's the deal's a deal, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what we said. And some of you go, well, yeah, but Elijah was powerful. He was the prophet of God in the Old Testament. I'm not Elijah. Please hear verse 17. Can I say it one more time? Verse 17. Elijah was a man just like us. The Lord, the Holy Spirit's trying to signal something to you as a believer that Elijah was powerful, but I would say this. Can I say something really, really bold? You have a better covenant than Elijah did. Because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. The blood hasn't been shed. The Holy Spirit didn't dwell inside. I mean, there was all kinds of benefits that the cross gave us. Elijah was a man just like us. And when he prayed, God, I, I, I want to I I show this to you. How many of you know we need rain in our day? And I don't mean physical rain. We need a rain of the Spirit. We need a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. We do. We have broken young people. It's crazy, these apps these kids are on, some of the stuff that's out there now, man, it's crazy. Jen was sharing with me an app that is so ungodly, and our kids are into it, and parents are like, this is neat, and it's like rape and abortion and sex, and it's, it's so gross, and, and, and we're just like, yeah, it's okay. We need a rain. We need a move of the Spirit of God, and I'm going to tell you who's going to call in that rain. It's going to be me and you. We're going to be the ones that are going to pray and see God move. So watch in 1 Kings 18. I want to show you when Elijah prayed. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink. So to the king, he says, go eat and drink. There's a sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel. By the way, it's a mountain. It's not a, it's not a Sunday. I was like, man, a whole mountain made out of Carmel. Wouldn't that be amazing? He bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees. And he says to his servant, He says, go look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and there was nothing there. And he said, seven times Elijah sent him back. Go back. The seventh time the servant reported a cloud, as small as a man's hand, rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, and the wind rose, and heavy rain came on Ahab uh, and uh, rode off to, to Jezreel. Listen to this. What a great story. Elijah's like to the king, you go and do your thing. Go eat. By the way, there's a lot of people who don't want to participate in the revival. They just want to go eat. Just want to go about their daily life. They just don't want their routine upset. They don't want their world upset. And Elijah's like, look, you just go away. I'm going to go up onto the mountain. And he went up on the mountain and he prayed. The Bible says, watch this. And he prayed earnestly. This was not a weak prayer. This was not a wimpy prayer. This was not a, oh, God, if it's your will. We pray that too much. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I say something? Of course we want God's will. Of course we believe in the sovereignty of God. Of course. But I'll tell you what, I think we wimp out too much with that. Well, if it's your will. That takes zero faith to pray that. What takes faith is for you and I to go up on the mountain and, like, believe God for something bigger than what's 
currently happening in our life and in our church. And, and he prayed earnestly. And then he told his servant, go and look over the mountain. Go, go look towards the sea and tell me what you see. And the servant comes back, I don't see anything. He says, go look again. Seven times. Can you imagine like the fifth time? He's like, man, I hate this job, right? The seventh time he comes back and goes, there's a cloud way off in the distance the size of a man's hand. And listen to what Elijah says. Tell everybody to hitch up their stuff and get safe because it's coming. I want you to see something. When Elijah says, I hear the sound. That's what he told Ahab. I hear the sound of heavy rain. Do you know that for people who love God and people who pray and people who love the word of God, do you know we hear things before we see them? It's true. What, how do you think a vision happens? The Lord speaks to somebody, oh man, I'm gonna go plant a church, or oh man, I'm gonna go do this, or oh man, I'm gonna do this with my business. Listen, vision happens in the heart. It happens here, and then it takes faith to walk it out. Right. Elijah, I hear the sound of heavy rain, and the servant's going, dude, it's dry out here. It's a dry and thirsty land. And Elijah says, get ready. And I'm telling you, as your pastor, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. I've been seeing it for about eight years. It's now about the size of two hands. But I see it. I, I, I can hear and see what you're probably not hearing and seeing. It's coming. James 5.17, I want, I want you to see this. Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed earnestly. And then it says, and he prayed again. Watch this, you guys. There's a difference between vain repetition and persistent prayer. Let me say it one more time. There's a difference between vain repetition, which Jesus said, don't pray like that, and persistent prayer. There's a difference between just babbling a prayer that you don't mean and getting down and pounding. I, I want to show you this in Luke 18.1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. Huh, I wonder if we should pray. He said to them, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town that kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversaries. For some time he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust just Watch this, the unjust judge. God is not unjust is what the Lord's trying to tell you here. And he will, uh, and will not God bring about justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? Who will, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, uh, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Oftentimes, you guys, please hear me, we, we quit too soon. We're not, we're not persistent enough. And the Lord's trying to build the prayer muscle in us and the faith muscle in us. That's why he doesn't just give us whatever we want right when we ask. He's trying to develop something bigger than you than just the promise. He's trying to develop a friendship with you and a relationship with you. And that persistence, listen, this widow just keeps bothering this judge. I love that. And God's like, bother me. Please hear me. Bother me. Pray audacious prayers. Ask for bigger things in your life, not just cars and houses, although I don't think that's wrong, but ask for me in a bigger way. Ask for revival. Ask for something yeah. bigger. Just quit. Would you please stop with your small prayers? I feel like the Lord's saying. We quit because we don't see evidence. We pray. We don't see it. We pray. We don't see it. We pray earnestly. We don't see it. And we pray again. And we pray again. And we pray again until, but we have to have the courage to keep asking. We have to have the courage to keep praying. We have to have the courage to keep coming to Wednesday nights and praying and worshiping. We have to have the courage to keep being part of 24-hour prayer meetings and believing that God wants to do something bigger than just have a church in Danville. That it's more about the kingdom and less about us. Amen? Yes. Prayer is not getting man's done Man's will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will done on earth. I don't know who said that, but it, somebody said that, not me. Prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven. It's getting God's will done on earth. And he needs some Elijahs 
just some mere men, just some house moms and some lawyers and some doctors and some people that drive buses and people that make coffee. He just needs some ordinary people to do something extraordinary. He just needs ordinary you to realize that when you pray, he listens to you and we call out and we call out for revival. I want to give you one last verse. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Therefore, let us come quietly. Therefore, let us come sheepishly to the throne of grace. Therefore, no, let us come boldly. The problem with a lot of us is we don't ask bold enough things. I'm serious. I actually believe that our dream and vision for the kingdom is not big enough. And we're praying, we're praying for stuff, but it's, it's just the Lord's like, man, I, you know, I can do, I want to do more than that. And we look at Elijah and go, yeah, prophet of God, man, look at all he did. You ever read the Bible and go, wow, those guys. Sometimes I read the Bible and go, hmm, yeah. Do you know that Elijah ran away from Jezebel in fear and discouragement? He wasn't perfect. This is Elijah the prophet. Right after he called fire down upon this altar and did away with all these prophets, Jezebel, a woman, says to him, I'm going to kill you. And he gets and runs away to a cave. I find it interesting that he ran away to a cave and met God in a deeper way. Came out of that cave, I believe, with a double portion of anointing and he gave it to Elisha. Listen, I really believe this. Jeze Do you know that, that Elijah didn't have to deal with Jezebel? God did. So there's a, there's a lesson there. When the enemy threatens you, God's going to deal with your enemy. Keep your focus. Come boldly. And please hear me. God's waiting for you to pray. He's waiting for you to believe. He's waiting for you to come out with a bigger voice and a bigger prayer life. Not, not a religious prayer life, but Lord, touch our city. I actually believe... It's funny, because you can tell where people's faith is when you say, God's going to move and thousands are going to be saved. People go, ah, that's nice. And then the others, other people you say that to, and they go, well, yeah, he's going to do it. I, that's what I like. I like when you say it and people go, let's do it. Because God wants to do it, right? He loves people.